overflow wherever we are. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how mighty, how matchless, how marvelous, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We thank you, God, for the privilege to call on your name. And we thank you that when we call, you answer. The truth is, God, you've answered even when we failed to call. Morning by morning, new mercies we see because you are a faithful God. For that we say thank you. Thank you, God, that you have not rewarded us according to our sin. Thank you, God, that you are still slow to anger. Thank you, God, that you still have a plan in store for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father for sustaining us, for covering us, for keeping us, for redeeming us, for filling us, and for moving in us right now. We pray, God, that your spirit might continue to tabernacle amongst your people. Somebody needs a touch from you after the wrong that they have experienced, the hurt, the disappointment. God, we need healing. We need deliverance. We need repentance and to be set right. Thank you, God, that you can meet our several needs with the same word. So speak right now. Your servants are listening. And have you choose to move, we care for to give you the credit. We'll say that Jesus did it. It's in Jesus' name that we want to say thank you. And all God's children said amen, amen, and thank God. Hallelujah. As we continue to stand, come on, put your hands together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Help me thank God for this wonderful choir chorale, praise team, whatever we call them now. I want to thank God for their willingness to share their gifts to the glory of God with us. As we continue to stand, I would that you would uh, meet me in Jeremiah, the first chapter. Meet me there in verse number four. We continue today in the series of messages we began on last week under the general heading, Play to Your Strength. And for that purpose, I want to begin reading today, Jeremiah, the first chapter, starting at the fourth verse, reading from verses Verse 4 through verse 10, as it appears on the screen, come on, let's read collectively. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. You all have been so kind and cooperative. Do the pastor one more favor. Look at somebody, smile and say, neighbor, in the name of Jesus, you need to push. Amen. Amen. God bless you. That's what I want to talk about. So spirit does speak and God does God. I just want to use this as a subject. You need to push. You need to push. I was watching one of those nature shows the other day. For those of you who know me, you know I love nature on TV. <laughs> I'm from Jersey, I ain't really. Uh, but I was watching this show and uh, I saw an elephant climb a tree to get to its leaves. Okay, well he didn't really climb the tree as much as he pushed it down. And once it fell to the ground, he was able to eat the leaves at his leisure. I'm bringing this up to say one thing to you. Stop trying to climb when God has given you power to push. Don't waste another year climbing when God has endowed you with pushing power. In other words, stop expending effort in the wrong areas. 
and play to the strength that God has already given you. All I'm saying is you need to push, 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 push. Purpose, uniqueness, supernatural heart. Push. Purpose. If you ain't writing uniqueness, supernatural in heart. I, I want to, to use the next few weeks to unpack this acronym because I think it will help us to have a framework to unlock all that God has already placed on the inside of us. What if I told you that what you're looking for is already within your possession? Dorothy, you already wearing the slippers. That's a whiz reference. I'm sorry, the Wizard of Oz reference. <laughs> All I'm trying to get you to see is, is that to each and every one of us, God has endowed us, positioned us, and given us all that is necessary to fulfill his calling of expectation upon our lives. And it begins with purpose. Let the church shout purpose. Purpose simply means that there is a problem that exists in this world that only you can solve. That, that, that there is something that humanity needs the kingdom needs that can only be unlocked through you. And in fact, the word picture for this week is a lock. It suggests that there is something of so much value that it had to be secured. But now that it is needed, it must be released. And not everybody can unlock the lock. In fact, that's why you're here. God is counting on you to release into the world that which it needs and doesn't even know it needs it. That now, now when I say the world, I don't, I don't want you to assume that unless you are going to make a global change, your life has been in vain. I'm simply suggesting that there is something in this world that was originally created from the world above but it needs you to unlock it so that whether it's in your family or in your community or for your people, that we will be benefited by your presence on the planet. Okay. Uh, that means that your purpose exists beyond you. <laughs> Only you can fulfill that purpose but by definition, that purpose is bigger than you. In other words, if you get up every day only to live for the benefit of yourself, you've yet to achieve purpose. Because God did not send you here just for your own benefit. He saved you that somebody else might receive the return of investment that he made when he changed your status from sinner to saint. I wish y'all would hear me. What I'm trying to get you to see is that there's something significant, unique. There's something supernatural. There's, there's a heart that God has given you to fulfill an assignment in this world. And it starts by you learning to push and to play to your strength. I, I, I appreciate the concept. It's, it's really not original to me. And, and it's been uh, professed by uh, a very large organization many of you are familiar with, uh, Gallup, the Gallup Company. Uh, the, the current chairman, his name is Jim Clifton, uh, espouses a concept which is simplicity itself, which simply says you don't get to where you need to be by trying to fix your deficiencies. You get to where you need to be by doubling down on your strengths. They, they, they have the strengths finder uh, assessment. Many of you all have taken it. And, and the concept is simply this, that once you discover what you're good at, focus on that. Because the Bible says your gifts will make room for you and bring you before great people. 
Jim Clifton tells a story about a man by the name of Vint Cerf, who was, who was uh, born deaf and as a consequence was enrolled in, listen to the name of the school, the deaf and dumb school. In other words, they labeled him by his limitation. But despite the limitations that they unwittingly placed on him, one of his teachers noticed that he was extraordinarily gifted in the area of math. And as a consequence, they began to encourage him to focus on his mathematics, and he ended up becoming a computer scientist, not just a computer scientist. He became the father, one of the two fathers of the current internet. Now, hear what I said. He focused on his strength. He did not spend the rest of his life trying to become the conductor of a symphony. Because to do that would be to try to improve his weakness. But rather, because he focused on his strength, we have an invention that has changed the trajectory of this world. John Maxwell picked up on the same concept and said, it doesn't make sense for you to spend your time trying to improve your talent score from a four to a seven, because at seven, you're just a little bit above average. He says, you want to find the place where you're a seven and try to bring that to a 10, because when you become a 10, now you become an expert, you become a master, you become exceptional, and now the world will pay you for being who you are. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to tell us, you need to push. I, I, ain't, I ain't talking about what I heard. I'm talking about what I know. Listen, y'all, we're having this conversation today because almost 30 years ago, when I first accepted my call and started moving into ministry, I was clear that I was not going to follow the traditional trajectory of the AME denomination. But because our tradition is once you accept your call and go to seminary, we send you out to a little storefront store church in the hood or send you out to one of them little churches in the country where two families control the whole thing and you got to fuss and fight and they know you ain't going to stay long so they ain't really invested and I understand but at the same time you going to get there and finally make a little difference till the bishop decides to promote you to another messed up church that you got to go back and have the same fight in and hope that over 30 years you end up at a half decent church. I, listen, I didn't know where I was going to go, but I knew what I was not going to do. And, and it's because I know my strengths and my weaknesses. I, I'm not good at internecine organizational politics. I'm not good at brown nose and an apple polish. And I'm not good at gently nudging people toward compromise. I can't take it take, trying to take months and years to do something that should have been done in days and weeks. I, I, I'm not the one. I'm, I'm more entrepreneurial. I'm good at innovating and problem solving and motivating and influence. I'm, I'm pretty good in the pulpit on a good day. I'm not the guy to go and sit at Big Mama's porch to ask her permission to change the color of the carpet, and I'm not the one. You don't want that because it ain't going to work out for me, and it ain't going to work out well for Big Mama. I'm just saying you got to know who you are so you can get to where you need to be so you can do what God has called you to do. I was never going to be successful there, and I'm not saying I'm successful here, but it wasn't going to be better there. It's better here because I'm where God has called me to be. Is there anybody listening to me right now that can recognize the blessing of doing what you were called to do and not what people put in front of you to do, what people tell you to do, but when you understand who you are and who you are not, you then can be used of God to be a blessing to others and be blessed yourself. Look at somebody and tell them you need to push. Now, now hear me, brothers and sisters, that's my makeup. But don't make my strength set and weakness set the meta narrative for everybody. I'm entrepreneurial, but not everybody is or should be entrepreneurial. I don't want my doctor to be entrepreneurial. <laughs> I, I, I don't want her to, to be researching on her own 
and trying out stuff when it comes to my care. I, I want her to be able to be energized by going through uh, the, 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 what has been agreed as the best path of finding restoration and healing for me. I don't want her experimenting on me. I want to make sure that, that she is energized because she has a methodical mind of checking off the boxes to make sure that I'm on the right path to care. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The moment you stop trying to live like the person next to you, the moment you stop trying to copy and duplicate what you've seen successful for others and just put yourself before the Lord and say, God, I may not be as smart as him. I may not be as quick as her, but I believe that you called me and saved me because there's some Something that's unique and valuable on the inside of me and God I'm just praying you will help me to unlock the native potential that you've placed on the inside of my soul is there anybody here that knows that God could have chosen to allow you not to be born but he birthed you he covered you and he kept you because there's something that nobody else on the planet Now, I just heard some of my smart folks say, now, Reverend, I hear what you're saying about play to your strengths, but, but, but that, that acts as if we don't have weaknesses. No, I, I want you to hear me. I'm suggesting that we should play to our strengths and neutralize our weaknesses. You have to be proficient at the minimal level so that your weakness doesn't take you out the game. Um, uh, t two of my favorite big men, Shaq and, and Draymond Green. I love their game because they play and play like big men. They, 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 they like the contact. They're here for all the smoke. In fact, they're known as smoke bringers. They're multi-champion, multi-all-star MVP big men. But, but, but Shaq had a problem in the skill area because as great as he was, everybody knew if you can get him on the foul line, it's going to be a whole nother situation. In fact, they created a term called what? Hack-a-shack. And then they had to create a rule because he literally had changed the nature of the game because they knew. In fact, his coach would have to take him out the game at the time that they needed him the most because they knew that Hack-a-shack could cause them to lose the game. Likewise, we're praying for Draymond Green real time because he has all the skill sets in the world, but he lacks sometimes the emotional control necessary to keep from getting a tech, which will cost his team or keep from getting thrown out the game or even worse from hurting somebody. We're praying that he gets the help that he needs because if he can simply neutralize his weakness, his strengths will allow his team to get back to the championship. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying, watch this, that the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That means that once God endows you with a capacity, once God gives you a ability, once God gives you a gift, he will not take it back from you and because the devil despises that which God is doing on the inside of you he seeks to nullify and neutralize your effectiveness and so because the devil can't take your gift he seeks to attack you in a different area to neutralize the efficacy of your gift he will attack you in your marriage he will attack your child he will attack your health he will attack you psychologically he will attack your spirit he will attack your emotions he will come in some other area to either distract you or discourage you from operating in the place of your strength. He will cause you to fall or to fail, or he will cause a sin in your life to rise up to the point where people will not be able to receive or appreciate your gift because he's messed up your reputation. You better hear what I'm saying. Unresolved sin is Satan's answer to unstoppable gifts. I want to say it again. I said unresolved sin is Satan's answer to unstoppable gifts. In other words, brothers and sisters, Samson died not because he lacked physical strength. He died because he never attended to his weakness in spiritual character. And how long is the list right now of individuals who are supernaturally gifted but have fallen from grace, not because they can no longer act or rap or sing or lead. It's because they did some stuff when they were outside of the record that causes us to no longer be able to receive their gift. 
Tell your neighbor, neighbor, your character has to keep you where your gifts bring you. I, I need y'all to talk to me. Is there anybody here that knows somebody right now who's actually more talented than you? They're smarter than you. They're gifted in you, more gifted than you, but they're not on the, on the court right now. Not because they're not gifted. It's because they don't have the discipline to stay out of trouble. They got character issues. They lie. They cheat. They steal. They do wrong. And that's why they're not playing right now. And so, I just came to tell you, it's time to push. It's time to play to your strength. It's time, listen, to fulfill your purpose. And, and that's what God was saying to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1. I, I want you to watch this real close. It's a text you've heard and read, but I want you to see it with new eyes. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Watch it real close. So, so according to this text, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Which means that your purpose is prenatal. Too fast. I saw it. I saw it. Right there. Okay. Before I formed you, before you were a parent for a microscope to detect, I knew you. So, so I pre-existed in the supernatural, my natural arrival. Not only did God know me, but God ordained me. So, so he had a purpose for me to... to, to to know me means that God conceived of me before my parents conceived of me. The, the Hebrew word for knowing is to conceive. And, and then he says, I sanctified you. To sanctify, watch this, means to set apart for the purpose of God. Okay, so... So, so this, this stand right here is, is just made of, of metal and acrylic. There's no holy mine from which they got the metal. There's no holy press from which they formed the acrylic. What makes it sanctified is that we don't do everything with this stand. I, I, I'm not selling beans and franks off the sand because it has a purpose for God. To, to be set aside, to be sanctified, means that I have been dedicated and designated and, and taken out of regular service so that God might be fulfilled through how he's using me. He said, before I knew you, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I sanctified you, I knew you, I ordained you, I authorized you, I gave you an assignment to be a prophet before the nations. Now, that was Jeremiah's call, but I want to say it again. I don't want you to believe that unless you are doing something that in, impacts the whole globe, that your purpose is in vain. Because you didn't hear what I'm saying. Your purpose is unique to me, but it's to you, but it's not measured in size, it's measured in submission. Are y'all writing this down? That 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 God, watch this, judges me not by how big the impact is, but how much I have aligned myself with what he told me to do. For, for those who have the, the blessed privilege of walking the hollow halls of Howard University, when you graduated, they sang a song at your commencement service that said, Lord, I done done what you told me to do. That, that, that my measure for living is not awards and accolades. It's not income and prestige and power. It's did I do what the Lord had in mind when he formed me in my mother's womb? So tell this to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, don't allow ego to equate size with what the Spirit said. 
Your name may never be mentioned in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the New York Times, but that does not mean that your name does not matter. As long as God is pleased with the way you live, it really doesn't matter what the people say. I just need about two or three folks that can look back in your own life at non-famous people who made all the difference in your life. Some teacher who saw potential in you when you saw nothing in the mirror. Some deacon, some preacher, some pastor who prayed for you and would not give up on you when you couldn't and wouldn't pray for yourself. Is there anybody here that knows that somebody whose name has never been printed made a difference and has been a blessing to your life, my question is, who's calling your name in that category? Who's grateful that you've been here? Who's better because you've been on earth? You've been here 40, 50, 60 years. There ought to be a list of people. Help me preach, Holy Ghost. We ought not be searching, trying to find somebody at your funeral to say something positive about you. If you live to your purpose, we, the issue's not going to be who going to speak. The issue is going to be how many people can we get on the program before we got to go to lunch because you've impacted so many people for the cause of Christ, the kingdom of God, and you brought value to their existence. If I can help somebody. As I travel along, if I can help somebody with the word of song, then my living will not be in vain. I don't want to hear him say, you made a lot of money. I want to hear him say, you had a lot of followers on Facebook. I want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh... Tell your neighbor you have a purpose, and you got to fulfill it. Now, 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 listen, listen. Your purpose may not be in the place of your employment. Um, Paul was a tent maker by trade. That's how he made a living. But he was an apostle of the Lord. And that's how he left a legacy. So stop equating your job with your joy. I'll say it again. Stop equating your job with your joy. They don't appreciate me. I'm going to quit this job. Let me ask you something. Do they pay you? That check hit every week, every two weeks. That's a good job. See, see, there are a few people who have the blessed privilege of getting paid for their purpose. But even those of us who get paid for our purpose got stuff about our job we can't stand. We have to work with people. I mean, let's be real. So at some point, you have to mature past an emotional assessment of your employment and realize that finding joy is about fulfilling your assignment on the job and off the job. I know y'all was waiting for something deep and heavy, but I'm just trying to tell you, maybe if you start looking at your place of employment as your first ministry field, where you live and walk and conduct yourself in such Christian character, that it begins to influence the individuals that are around you without violating the HR policies. <laughs> see, see, when you are a believer, you can't help it. It just oozes out of you. It, it just... Okay, okay, let me see if I can make that plain. You know how some I've been drinking? And try to act like they ain't been drinking. <laughs> but their pores keep telling on them. 
Well, what if you have so much saturation in the spirit that without quoting a scripture or telling them about kingdom fellowship, it just oozes out that there's something spe special, something spiritual, something supernatural about this individual. They must be with God. That, that, that listen, that at the end of the day, if you get to be paid for your purpose, great, but that does not negate the fact that you still have one and you have a calling to fulfill it. Listen, the super majority of pastors have full-time secular jobs. I'm one of the few, the ministers on our staff are of just a handful of the few that get to do our purpose full-time. Most of our people, our, our colleagues, are having to serve in ministry after hours. But when it's your purpose, you'll do it because it's what you're supposed to do. I, listen, y'all, I'm grateful to God. It's worked out so well so far. But the truth is, I've preached with equal passion to two and five. You've heard me say it before, but let me give you context. When we've had 20 and 30 people join, I've said on several occasions, I done preached my heart out to many less than this, but I preached with just the same power and passion because God did not call me to a numbers game. God called me to be faithful to his purpose. And if you stop trying to compare and stop trying to use your ego to measure your effectiveness, you'll realize that God has something for you that will allow you to sleep at night no matter how much you paid for the bed. I wonder if there's anybody here that knows that there's no greater place in the whole wide world than to be found in the will of God. I feel like preaching. Y'all excuse me. Then he said, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So, so God puts this major calling on him. For you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you. I sanctified you. I ordained you. And, and you know what Jeremiah said? You know, God, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, I love you. But... I'm too young for what you are calling me to do. Now, here's the thing. What he said was factual. Jeremiah was very young of age when God called him. His age was a fact, and it, in, in fact, it was the thing that was blocking his mind from receiving, walking in his purpose. Remember I told you last week that you need to renegotiate some stuff? And that your best life is waiting for you to take out some of the non-negotiables you've been living by? What if I told you that some of the very things you're suffering and frustrated with right now are on the opposite side of a no you've given to God? God, I would, but you don't know what they did. God, you know I would, but, 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 you know, I'm so young, I'm so old, I'm black. <laughs> you fill in the blank with the convenient excuse you've used to keep from doing what God's called you to do. As if, watch this, God didn't know who he was calling when he called. Preach, Pastor. I'm doing the best I can. Like, Jeremiah telling God I'm young was news to God. You know, I didn't realize. I take it back. No. God, so, so, so if you come up with a reason, an excuse, even if it's based in fact, you got to ask yourself a question. Did God not know the fact before he said what he said? Listen, by definition, for God to use you, it must be in an area that you cannot accomplish on your own. 
which means he has already taken into account all of your limitations, all of your weaknesses, all of your shortcomings, all of your issues, and he called you anyway, which means that God has a plan if you simply focus on your strength and keep prioritizing your purpose to neutralize your weaknesses so that he can use you for his glory and for your good. God, you've heard it before, does not call the qualified. What does God do? He qualifies the call. So, 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 so I don't know what the issue is you've been trying to use, but I need you to know God knew it and he called you anyway, which means you don't get to disqualify yourself from the call of God. The, the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. In other words... I factored it in, and what I need you to understand is that the facts don't matter. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was confined to a wheelchair when he ran this country and the world as president. He did not allow the discriminatory views of the differently abled of his time to keep him from pursuing the presidency. He believed that despite how people are, God was bigger than how people are. And, and so he played to his strength because from a wheelchair, he still had a brilliant mind and an affable personality. And, and he used his compassion and his wealth and privilege to allow him to play to his strength. All I'm trying to say to you, my brothers and sisters, is that if you simply focus on what God has given you, it's enough to bring you beyond where you are to where he's purposed and planned for you to be. He, he said, listen, you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. You know what he was saying? I'm sending you, but I ain't sending you by yourself. I'm going with you. I'm going to give you what you need when you need it. Oh, that, that messed somebody up right there. But because we want all the information before we start walking. Now, Lord, show me how it's going to happen. Where are you going to send the money? Who going to give me the hookup? How it's going to happen? God said, listen, I can't give you more information than you can handle. I, I need some real folks to talk about this next point. Um, can anybody acknowledge the fact that if you knew what you were getting into before you got in it, you never would have gone. If you knew how you're going to have betrayal and heartache and have to sacrifice and be disappointed and frustrated on your way to building your career, of going into ministry, of being married, of being a parent, of getting your degree, of building your business, you'd have stayed right where you were. But the truth is, even though you didn't know it and even though it cost you more, you wouldn't take nothing for your journey because God gave you what you needed at every crisis, at every downturn, at every point so that you made it to where you are and you ain't going back to where he brought you from. I need about three or four hundred folks in here that can testify to the fact that God is faithful and he will put the words in your mouth to speak. He'll tell you when to be quiet. He'll raise up friends. He'll use enemies. He'll bring resources supernaturally. God has supernatural ability to give you what you need when you need it. Give somebody a high five real quick and say, neighbor, he's an on-time God. Now talk back to him and tell him, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Won't he show up? Won't he work it out? Now God sometimes will play too much and push past the deadline and allow stuff to last, but he's just trying to show you I'm God. I'm in control. I don't move and I'm not confined by deadlines and process and bureaucracy. I can bless when I want to bless. I pull one up. I take another down. I'm God and I'm God all by myself. I'm out of here. Don't be afraid, he said of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. Now, now God is saying a whole lot to Jeremiah, but it's real general. I, I appoint you a prophet of the nations. I'll put my word in your mouth. Don't be afraid. I'm here. To I need some specifics, Lord. 
But, but what I need you to understand, watch this, is that God is saying, this is why faith, is that you can't please me without faith. Because faith says, when I can't trace you, I will still trust you to direct my steps and order my path. So, so, so he says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to deliver you, even though I'm not giving you, I'm not giving you who, what, when, where, and why. I, I just need you to trust, watch this, that I'm going to work it out. So last thing I'm going to say to you, and I'm done, is that means in pursuit of your purpose, do not get caught in the analysis paralysis. Oh, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to church folk. And church folk will come up with church-sounding reasons from, from, keep, from having to be the church. Well, you know, Pastor, I know I ain't serving in ministry. But I just don't want to be out of order. I just don't want to be out of place. That's not Bible. Listen, do you think in 1995, when I said yes to God, when he called me to preach, I saw us sitting here at 11710 Bellsville Drive in Calverton, Maryland in 2024. All I knew is that he said, preach. So I preached. And he brought me to seminary. And I preached my way through seminary. And then he brought me to a preacher I'd never heard of, a fellow by the name of Lee P. Washington. Never heard of him. And, and when he, he, he called me to be his youth minister, but I was trying to politic to become the uh, director of religious affairs to the mayor of D.C. <laughs> Felt like it fit more of my personality and gifts. <laughs> and, and, and he said to me, we were at Jasper's over in Greenbelt, and he, and he said to me, uh, well, why can't you do both? I said, I like the way this man thinks. <laughs> so, so I started working in youth ministry. Now, I'm the youth minister. He's a senior pastor, but ain't no other full-time preachers on staff. So even though I'm youth minister, I'm just starting to do stuff. I'm starting to, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in screens. Ain't part of my job description. But when you operate in purpose, you don't worry about what the paper says. You do what your purpose is. I'm putting in screens. And they about to build a new church. And so they bring me into uh, the meeting to, uh, to comment about the youth section. So I made my comments and stayed at the table. <laughs> and I stayed at the table long enough to find out when the next meeting was. <laughs> and guess at the meeting, who showed up? And I made some more comments. They had nothing to do with the youth section this time. And after that meeting, Dr. Washington called me to the office and said, man, I'm going to put you over this project. Sir, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make you the executive minister, and you're going to be over the construction of the new church. I said, Doc, I ain't never built nothing but with Lego. I was just talking. <laughs> he said, you got it, because see, sometimes people can see more in you than you see. <laughs> so now I'm the executive minister reporting to People are reporting to me who are old enough to be my father. So the great part, Herman, is every time we have a construction meeting, they start talking to the old people in the room and the old people looking at me. <laughs> and you can see it every time it's the same thing. Oh, shoot, the kid's in charge. <laughs> That's right, I am. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but we ain't going to leave the table till I understand. So, so, so we move into to, to Reed Temple, 11400 Glendale Boulevard, and uh, in 2004, I go to Doc, hey, man, I feel like Montgomery County is wide open. I think we should start a campus. Do it. Don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> April 16, 2006, we at Montgomery Blair High School in a cafeteria. I'm preaching my little heart out. Oh, I'm preaching. I'm yanking it. I'm pulling up. I'm talking now, but I was sweating then. I was working. Here's a revival every Sunday. And the Lord blessed. And the Lord blessed. And four years later, we moved over to Tech Road. 
1201 Tech Road in Silver Spring. Started one service, then went to two services, then went to three services. Found us a building we were trying to, to build our new church on, but, but the parking covenants wouldn't let us build it there, but then the FDA gave us a 10-year, $24 million contract. I said, oh, we buying that in the name of Jesus. That's a good investment. And then we bought this property, and then in 2022, in the middle of a pandemic, because God was faithful and the people were faithful, we walked up in here on Easter Sunday morning. Now, what about that story did I know in 1995? And you're going to sit here and tell me I'm waiting to figure out what the devil is alive. You better start moving, and when you start moving, God will direct you. He will redirect you. He will order your steps, but you got to start moving forward. Everybody Jesus calls as a disciple already had a job, already had an assignment, but he just said, follow me. He didn't tell them where he was going or what they were going to do, but he said, follow me. And guess what they did? They started following him, and we're the better before it. I want you to stand. I'm through preaching, but I want to say this to you. I want to say this to you. What you're seeking from Tyson's, and Tyson's too. what you're looking for on Match and Tinder. The reason you keep posting on Instagram and Facebook is because you're seeking to satisfy a hunger on the inside of you. And the likes and the comments, it'll scratch the itch for a minute, but then you're going to be hungry again. You, you get the stuff at the store, it's going to feel good the first time. You wear it after that. What's up with everything else? Uh, you going to get your new boo? And what you say, Dr. Darrell, is going to be the same boo as the last boo with a different name. Can I ask you, how come you've had four and five and six promotions and you're still hungry? Some of you making more than you ever have, still hungry. It's because there's a God-shaped hole in your soul that only his purpose can fulfill. You don't get it by figuring it out. You get it by walking it out. And God then orders your steps in his word. I want to pray for you, Father, in Jesus' name. We glorify you and praise you that there is an assignment for each of us to fulfill, a destiny calling, a God-given purpose, a lock that needs to be opened. God, I pray that you'll direct us to fulfill the purpose for which you created us. And God, I pray that you will bother us until we submit, frustrate us until we obey. Because, God, we're not going to be satisfied or fulfilled functioning under our own accord. But, God, the moment we say a full yes to you, we begin to be used by you. And the hunger begins to be satisfied. So I thank you, God, for your great salvation. You saved us for us to serve you and to serve others. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. Your spirit shows up in those moments to give us what we need when we need it. Now God, use us for your glory and for our good. I pray God for anybody under the sound of my voice who is not saved, who doesn't know your great salvation. 
who's never accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. If you're, God, I pray that you will bring them forward right now, that they might know you in the pardoning of their sin. God, I pray for anybody who may already be saved. They're a Christian, but they're a homeless Christian. They don't have a church home where they're rooted, planted, where they're growing. They hop around, they shop around, but they've yet to make a commitment. And that's why they're still stuck. God, I pray that you'll bring them forward, that they might have a growth spurt in the spirit, that you might do a new thing in their lives. Now, God, bring the harvest for your glory and for our goodness. In Jesus' name, we want to say thank you. All God's children said amen.